Hello and welcome. My name is Gina Sa and I am an infectious diseases physician leading our phage program here at Mayo Clinic. I'd like to welcome you to our Advancing Care Through Genomics virtual speaker series focused on phage therapy. Today is the second in our multi-part series. Dr. Andrew Badley is joining me as a moderator for the event. Dr. Badley is the Enterprise Chair of the Department of Molecular Medicine and Associate Chair of, the, of Research in the Department of Medicine here at Mayo. Before I introduce our speaker, just a few housekeeping items. Please use the Q&A in Zoom to submit your questions, which we will take at the end of the session. And for those interested in earning CME credit, an email will be sent within 48 hours that includes instructions on how to claim credit. So we are delighted to welcome Dr. Graham Hatful as our featured speaker today. Dr. Hatful is a professor of biological sciences, Everly Family Professor of Biotechnology, and Howard Hughes Medical Institute Professor at the University of Pittsburgh. He received his PhD in molecular biology from Edinburgh University and did postdoctoral work at Yale University with Nigel Grindley and at the Medical Research Council at Cambridge University with Fred Sanger and Bart Burrell. Dr. Hat Hatberg's, sorry, Hatful's research focuses on the molecular genetics of mycobacteria and their bacteriophages. He is a fellow of the American uh, Academy of Microbiology, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Hatful has inspired all of us uh, by successfully treating a, a post-lung transplant CF patient with disseminated mycobacterium abscessus with engineered mycobacterial phages. This case has given hope to all of us who take care of patients with seemingly untreatable infections not responsive to conventional methods. We are incredibly grateful to have Dr. Hatful join us today for his webinar, From Petri Dish to Patient, Mycobacteriophages and Their Therapeutic Potential. Well, let me say thank you very much. Um, and here we go. Let me say thank you very much for the uh, very kind invitation, and I'm delighted to be able to share with you some stories about bacteriophages and their potential therapeutic uh, uses uh, today. Um, my my plan here is to uh, talk a, a little bit about the the, the case that uh, uh, that Dot Su uh, mentioned in the introduction. But I'll divert to tell you a little bit more about what we understand about bacteriophages and uh, mycobacteriophages, phages that infect uh, the mycobacteria. Um, and then I'll return to uh, thinking about um, what the challenges are and the opportunities are in, in, in potential phage therapies for mycobacterial uh, infections. Uh, and I hope to conclude with plenty of time uh, for questions and answers. And, and I'll emphasize now that there will be points, uh, especially as I talk about the biology of the phages, that I'm going to keep as either very brief or as summaries. Uh, and so I would alert you in particular that if you're interested in some of those areas or questions, we'll return to that during the Q&A uh, uh, session uh, at the end. Okay, so in October 2017, I had an email message from a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. James Suthill in London, uh, a, a colleague that I had met uh, a number of years before at a small conference in, in, in Tbilisi in Georgia. And, and so James was aware that, uh, that we worked with the bacteriophages of the mycobacteria. And, and at the Great Ormond Street Hospital there in London, they had uh, two patients two young patients with similar profiles, both with cystic fibrosis, bilateral, bilateral lung transplants, uh, and, and with disseminated mycobacterium abscessus infections um, that, that they essentially had run out of options uh, to treat. And actually one of the patient's um, mum's uh, suggestion was that, was that they should perhaps explore the possibility of, of uh, phage therapies and relatively few people, uh, researchers work with phages of the mycobacteria. And so it was a fairly natural link for James to, to, to contact us. Um, 
The reason why we were interested is because um, we have not previously studied bacteriophages of Mycobacterium obsessus, but we are generally interested in the question of uh, phage infection, strain specificity of host range, and what determines whether some phages infect some strains of bacteria and not others. And that dynamic uh, and the genetics and the underlying biology of those dynamics is something that we're interested in. And this was another opportunity for us to study it. So uh, they had the two strains of Mycobacterium obsessus that were highly antibiotic resistant. Um, the patients essentially um, had run out of options. And the question was whether we could use phages to treat them therapeutically. Uh, this is just one of the patients that we'll talk about more and was described in the in the paper published last year, Isabel Carnell Holdaway, and it was her mum who had uh, made the inquiries as to whether phage therapies might be worth uh, worth entertaining, and therefore prompted uh, the the that subsequent conversation. Um, this was the condition uh, essentially pre-treatment with the phages. She'd been on, on a long series of, of antibiotics and immunosuppressive uh, drugs here for the, to, to support the transplant. Um, uh, had many uh, skin nodules on the uh, on, on limbs, as as you can see here. The sternal wound from the, the sternal wound from the incision from the transplant was, was quite badly infected. And you can see this had disseminated and this was a fairly sizable infected node uh, in, the, in the liver. And, and she had been sent home on palliative care. So the question was whether we would have bacteriophages would be, would be, uh, would be potentially useful therapeutically. So let me introduce bacteriophages for those of you who don't know them and, and, and more about uh, what we know about them and these particular uh, mycobacteriophages. So phages are simply viruses. They're just viruses that infect bacteria. They have all of the common properties of viruses. They do not replicate by themselves. They're absolutely dependent upon the host. Um, they tend to be very specific for the bacteria that they infect, which is certainly at the genus level, sometimes at the species level, but often at the strain level as well. Um, the majority of phages are, are double-stranded DNA tail phages, uh, and that's true for all of the ones that I'm going to tell you about today. Um, I'll, I'll mention it's important that uh, we can think of some of these as being lytic, meaning they infect and kill their bacterial host, but others, in fact, the majority are probably temperate uh, and can do that kind of infection, but have alternative uh, uh, life states that they can engage in. And the phage population we've learned in recent times is huge, it's dynamic, it's old, and it's highly diverse. And so this has been illustrated by our, our colleagues that study uh, phage ecology. Um, this image is simply showing a, uh, an uh, epiphorescence where a sample of water was stained with a, a, a nucleic acid staining dye. And all of these small dots here are the, ph are the phages predominantly. And these are bacteria in the large dots and, and other larger organisms. But this is a very effective way of very simply being able to count the total viral populations. And so from this, it's clear that the phages are present at 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7 particles per mil uh, in most types of sam samples, like water samples. And, and extrapolation uh, suggests that there's something like 10 to the power of 31 phage particles in the biosphere in total, which would make them, in terms of their numbers, uh, an absolute majority of all biological entities uh, in the biosphere. They're simply more phage particles than all other forms of life added together. Um, amazing in their vastness. Thank goodness that they're small. The population is very dynamic. There's about five to one or 10 to one ratio between phage and bacteria um, in most samples that you can look at. And it's estimated there's about 10 to the power of 23 phage infections per, per second on a global scale. And so the whole population is, is, is embroiling, is, is, uh, is dynamically interacting, and, and the whole phage population largely uh, turns over and replaces itself by this infectious process every few days. 
And from structural comparisons, it's likely and considered that this is probably a really old population as well and may extend way back, perhaps three billion years or before to the very early times uh, of, uh, of the evolution of, uh, of, of biological forms. Given this, it's not surprising that genetically they're really diverse. And that diversity is a question that we've been interested in trying to characterize and to define how many different types of phages are, how do they differ from each other? How do they get to be the way we see them? There's at least two really, I think, good ways of trying to understand that diversity. One is a metagenomic approach where you take a sample of phages and you concentrate them and then sequence them uh, deeply and just study the sequence information that you get. Um, a great way of looking at diversity and at dynamics. Uh, it gives you a lot of data that sits and, fi and, and fills up your computer screens. A second approach is what we would think of as a phage by phage or a genome by genome approach where individual phages are grown and studied and, uh, and genomically characterized, um, which clearly gives you much less data. You fill up your hard drives a lot less quickly, um, but you not only have the sequence in the genomic data, but you have the entities themselves. So you have, you have uh, the, the materials, that not only sit in the hard drive, but sit in your freezer as well. And so we have collections of large numbers of phages that can then be propagated, studied, engineered, and of course, potentially used therapeutically. And it's that second strategy that we've taken advantage of in particular. I told you that phages are specific for the hosts. So if you want to isolate phages from the environment, you have to choose a host. Perhaps you could argue almost any host would be of interest if you just want to explore and define the diversity of the phage population. Um, but in thinking about that, we chose a, a strain in particular, Mycobacterium smegmatis, because it would not only help us address that question, but because it's a relative of these uh, pathogens, important pathogens like Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and of course, Mycobacterium obsessus, um, that we reasoned back 30 years ago or, 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 or so, that we would not only learn about phage diversity and evolution and phage origins, but we would be able to learn and to use the information that we gather in order to develop tools, for example, genetic tools, strategies and approaches that help the study, uh, that advance the genetic systems for studying some of these more difficult bacteria. And I think that has certainly been, been, been a good outcome um, from the last a few years of study. We're actually interested in phages of, of, of many different strains within the phylum of the actinobacteria, but I'm obviously going to talk predominantly about these mycobacteria phages uh, today. Um, it perhaps wouldn't be such an exciting uh, project for a, a graduate student perhaps to isolate thousands of individual phages and characterize them. I think it could get tedious after a while. But rather than doing that, we've developed uh, or helped to develop integrated research education programs where it is students, relatively large numbers of students, uh, that are uh, engaged in the process of isolating and characterizing the phages. The largest of these programs is the so-called sea phages program. Um, this is a uh, has nothing to do with the, the oceans. The C is an is an acronym for the Science Education Alliance, which is a program at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, and this and some related programs have all been developed uh, together with colleagues at HHMI. And so this is the Science Education Alliance, Phage Hunters Advancing Genomics and Evolutionary Biology. And I won't say too much more about it um, unless we'd like to talk about it more at the end. But uh, this started in, in 2008. Uh, institutions have been added each year. There's about 150 institutions. They range from community colleges to R1 universities. Uh, and currently, we're about 5,000 or a little over 5,000 students per year, mostly first year undergraduate students, all isolating uh, phages, characterizing them, naming them, and genomically uh, studying them. And so this is really what the students do. They start with a, uh, an environmental sample uh, and then use a simple plaque assay with a bacterial strain of choice. Uh, and by a simple extraction and looking for these tiny plaques or clearings, 
um, you can identify a, a, a phage and you can purify it and propagate it, uh, characterize it by uh, electron microscopy, for example, characterize the DNA, sequence the genome, uh, identify the, the genes, and learn about diversity and evolution by comparative genomic analyses. And it's because the diversity is very high, the chances of discovering new phages and new genes is also very high. So there's a very uh, a strong component of discovery um, that the students uh, uh, engage in as they do this research program. Because we have the data here that is collected in a more disseminated way, we have a website, a database and a website at phagesdb.org where students uh, enter their information and it's publicly available. So uh, everybody, the students and others can access the information. And uh, this is, uh, as I said, is, uh, is uh, publicly available. You can go and, and check out uh, phages of interest uh, if, you're, if you would so like. Um, I would just point out a couple of points about the collection here. Total number of phages that have been isolated and that we have archived in, in, in Pittsburgh is, uh, is over 18,000. Um, about 10,000 of those were isolated on mycobacteria and the others are on other other strains as listed here. We've sequenced about three and a half thousand genomes. We've sequenced them. They have been carefully and manually annotated by students. And so we think that the annotations are pretty high quality. Uh, and just under 2000 of those are the mycobacteria phages um, that I'll talk about more uh, right now. And so these are phages which are predominantly isolated on a single strain of Mycobacterium smegmatis. So this gives a really deep insight of what the diversity looks like if you just look at phages, environmentally isolated phages on a single strain of a single species of bacteria. So um, I'm going to go through just a couple of these summary points here because I don't have time to dwell on them. I'll, I'll expand on a couple and then we'll come back to those items that may be of interest uh, in, uh, in, in the question and answers. So first of all, in terms of morphologies, what the phages look like, if you look at them in the electron microscope, they appear to be very limited in terms of the types and the morphologies. There's really only two particular types of morph morphologies that are seen that vary by the types of tails that they have attached to the heads. Um, if that was the only measure of diversity, um, one wouldn't take this project very far. But once you start looking at the genomes, you can see that they're extremely diverse, lots and lots of different sequences and different types of genomes. And I will say a little bit more about that uh, in a minute. This diversity is generated in large part because of the architectural nature of how they're put together. The genomes are architecturally mosaic, meaning that um, you can think of them as, an, as a large set, a very large set of individual um, mosaic tiles or modules, if you like, often individual genes that can be put together in lots of different combinations. And so you find genes in different contexts and you can combine them in many different ways. And this can give you just these vast numbers of different types uh, of genomes. So lots of different modules, lots of different combinations of putting them together. I mentioned briefly about phages being either lytic or temperate. Um, more than 50% of the mycobacteria phages are temperate. This is not uncommon. Um, some types of phages, phages of some hosts can be biased towards being more lytic types of phages or more temperate types of phages. But, uh, but uh, a lot of these are temperate and, it, and it's, we, it's not a surprise. And I'll come back and mention a little bit to clarify exactly what we mean by being temperate. Infection is, is tends to be very strain specific, um, species and strain specific. I'll say a little bit more about that as we talk about mycobacterium obsessus. But again, this is not an unusual feature. Um, and the specificity is fundamentally dictated and determined by this highly dynamic nature because the phages are constantly infecting bacteria and killing them over 3 billion years. The bacteria have to survive in some way, so they have and acquire and develop defense mechanisms. And then the phages have to be able to co-evolve, either by moving to a new host or acquiring the ability to counteract 
uh, those uh, defense mechanisms. So phage and bacterial genomes are replete with these tools and systems and mechanisms that defend against phage infection or are countering the defenses against phage infection. And so some of these things are familiar restriction modification, CRISPR-Cas is just a phage defense system. Uh, they're prevalent. There are anti-CRISPR-Cas systems, anti-restriction systems encoded by phages. Many types of so-called abortive uh, infection systems, which are active, uh, active in defense. And, and a thing that we've worked on quite a lot, and I won't say too much more about here, is, is that defense systems are often encoded by the phages themselves. And so temperate phages that can establish themselves inside a host actually contribute substantially to the dynamics by encoding defense systems that protect against attack and infection by other phages. And so that's why in part we're interested in this is because these defense systems are essentially dictating what the specificity is and the specificity turns out to be a key question when we think about using them therapeutically and then of course there are these anti-defense systems as well so a couple of words on the diversity and i'll just put a clarity about uh, about the temperate nature of these infections and so th this is just showing um uh, a, a relationship of genomes um illustrating the overall diversity. These are actually all phages within the actinobacteria, so it includes mycobacteria and others. What I've done is taken just essentially one of each genomic type, if you like, and then uh, it's a phylogenetic network analysis by, by gene content comparison. And the point is, is you can see how these all radiate from the central point, which is just illustrating the fact that, that you have many, many genes and ge ge genomes that share essentially little or no genetic information. However, if we were to take, for example, the phages that infect the mycobacteria, they're not all equally different to each other. There's phages that may share a lot of their sequences and their genes, and then pairwise, there may be those that don't share anything. And so what we do by virtue of, of more convenience really than anything else is we take phages that are closely related and we put them into what we call clusters. And so if phages are related, we put them within the same cluster. And if they're different, they go into different clusters. And these clusters themselves are highly diverse. And so there's lots of variation within a cluster, but it's often um, heterogeneous in nature. So you can subdivide some clusters into subclusters uh, depending on their genomic characteristics. And then I'll introduce this term of a singleton, which is a phage for which we've only got one of a kind. There is no other close relative that's yet been characterized of that type. And so for the mycobacteria, <laughs> currently we have 29 clusters, there's 10 singletons. So this is far from saturated, right? We have 10 phages for which there must be other relatives out there, but we only have one. Um, and, and yet we have a, a, a large number of clusters and, and, and subclusters. Singletons together comes to 89. As I say, each of these can be very diverse in and of themselves. And it's very um, heterogeneous in terms of its numbers. Okay, so there's one cluster, we call them cluster A, for example. I think we have 650 phages, and yet there are others for which we only have one. So the way you sample is very, is very uh, variable uh, depending on the genomic type that you get. And um, just as an illustration, I would just show you here some of these examples. So I've just taken uh, here three genomes, each from cluster A. Um, this is a bird's eye view, so you're not, it's not intended to look at the finer points. The boxes that you can maybe see are the genes, the color boxes of the genes. And this shading between genomes pairwise reflects DNA sequence similarity. And it's, uh, it's spectrum colored. And so violet color is very similar. Um, white is below a threshold value. And then, and then red is the other end of the spectrum. Okay. So it's nucleotide sequence similarity. So that's what some examples of cluster A look like. Um, this is this, this other cluster, I think that's E. See there, it's off my screen. Maybe these are F. And I was just sitting there for a while. We're working on. We're working on that. 
Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and, and cluster K. And so um, you, you can just see the various and complex types of relationships. Um, and where here with these cluster K, you can see these segments of close sequence similarity, but interspersed with regions of either poor or complete lack of, of, uh, of, of relationship. And this reflects the mosaic nature of these things being put together in pieces that you can see at the nucleic acid level of comparison. And if you compare at the gene level using amino acid sequence similarity, you can see this with even greater resolution. So this is how genomes, phage genomes are put together, this is what they look like. Briefly to clarify what I mean by uh, phages being temperate, um, I want to clarify what life cycles are. So um, phages, lytic phages, uh, have this characteristic behavior when a phage infects its host, it infects the cell, it replicates, it kills the cell, and all of the new phage progeny are released to go on and do more infections. And if you do a plaque assay where you simply look on a lawn of bacteria, this lytic phage will form this nice clear plaque where all of the cells have been killed in order to replicate the phages. Temperate phages can do that, but they don't have to. Um, maybe 10% or maybe let me say 90% or so of the time, they may choose that pathway, um, but 10% or more, there's an alternative pathway that can be chosen, which is called the establishment of lysogeny. And in lysogeny, the cells are not killed. The phage DNA is injected into the cell. The genes for lytic growth are switched off, and this becomes established in the bacterial cell um, in a long-term state, usually integrated into the host chromosome. And, and this lysogen can grow for, 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 for many, many, many generations um, with this phage DNA or the prophage hiding away in the, in the, in the chromosome. And so these temperate phages tend to form these turbid looking plaques where it, you see a plaque because some infections are going through lytic growth, just as you would see with a lytic phage. But then there's bacteria growing in, inside this plaque and these bacteria are these lysogens. So if you have a temperate phage, you see turbid plaques and you can easily grow and isolate the lysogens from here. They're perfectly stable. So not only is lysogeny uh, and temperate phages common, most bacterial strains are lysogenic. If you sequence the genomes of bacteria, you find that there's commonly one or more prophages hiding away uh, in their genomes. This is a common state of the microbial world, not an unusual one. Okay, so with that, I want to return to, to say more about these two strains that were sent to us from London, GD01 and GD02. Um, and, and I'll just finish the story of these, and then I'll talk about our, our interest in expanding uh, the potential use of phages more broadly. So when we received these strains and begun to think the possibility of using phages therapeutically, we figured that we'd probably want to have more than one phage um, for a treatment because given the relatively high bacterial load in the body, uh, we're worried that if you just treat with one phage, you would rapidly get resistance to that phage just as you would with antibiotics, and then you're out of options. And so the goal from the get-go was to try to find three phages preferably um, that could be used. Now, obviously, the idea of using them in a cocktail in a combination that way is the idea that if the strain would become resistant to one phage, that it would still remain sensitive to the others. Now, of course, we actually know rather little about those about that process, especially in Mycobacterium uh, obsessus. And so our goal was to essentially to try to use phages which were genomically distinct uh, on the expectation that there's, un there's less likely to be common resistance mechanisms amongst genomes, phage genomes that are more distantly related. And that's partly why that genomic information was incredibly helpful for us in, in trying to design this from the beginning. 
Obviously, the phages should be good killers and should be lytic. Using temperate phages where there's high levels of survival, i.e. lysogens, uh, was unlikely to be very attractive. And we need to be able to propagate these phages and they need to be stable uh, and, and can be used suitably. The problem starting out, I mean, the, the very starting problem is that nobody had isolated, uh, I think, any phages of Mycobacterium abscessus for any strain previously. And when we tried, uh, we found it um, to be unproductive. We have isolated some phages by sampling de novo using Mycobacterium abscessus, but it's a very low yield. And that is really why we turned to this large collection of phages, which had been isolated on Mycobacterium smegmatis. We knew that a subset of those, a genomically defined subset, can also infect other strains such as Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And so we had a sense that some, some of these phages and groups of phages may be very particular to Mycobacterium smegmatis, but there are others that have broader host ranges. And those groups were the likeliest to have phages that might infect these M. obsessor strains. And that's why we started looking. And so this is just illustrating these plaque assays that we used. This is just a dilution of a particular phage stock on, on a control lawn of Mycobacterium smegmatis and then testing on these other two strains. Um, for this particular strain, which is the one we're going to talk a bit more about, GD01, which is the one from, from young Isabel, um, we were only able to find one phage called Muddy that efficiently kills that strain from everything that we tested. Uh, there's a couple of hundred individual phages we've tested. We've done some other things that expands that a little bit, but this strain is really only infected efficiently by this naturally occurring phage called Muddy. So we were pleased to have one, um, and it turns out, I'll show you, Muddy actually kills the strain quite nicely. We were pleased to have one, but disappointed that we didn't have more than one. And so the question is, what, we, what could we do about that? And what we did was we noticed that there were phages like this phage Zoe J, which does appear to infect this strain Mycobacterium obsessus GD01, but it's, it's hardly a compelling infection. The plaques look very turbid um, and the, the infection looks poor and the killing looks poor. Zoe J actually is a temperate phage. These plaques don't look very turbid on this particular picture, but it is a temperate phage. And we reasoned that if we could engineer this so that it was no longer temperate, uh, that it would have a better characteristic. And so what we did was we took our Zoe J uh, phage and we used this engineering tool that we had developed um, based on, on a recombinering approach that it lets us relatively efficiently engineer the phage genome to remove or to alter genes at will. And specifically for Zoe J, we knew from prior characterization, our basic studies, that there was a gene called the repressor gene, which is required for lysogeny. The hypothesis being then if we specifically engineer this gene out by, by precise removal, that we'll convert it from a temperate phage to a lytic phage that would then be therape therapeutically useful. This is the deletion strain here where we've deleted the repressor. And now you can see this infects quite well and kills quite well. This was phage number two in our cocktail. For phage number three, it was a derivative of a of a parent phage called BPS that we had isolated some time ago in, in, in Pittsburgh. Um, we did the same engineering to remove the repressor gene. Uh, this is the BPS Delta 33. However, that alone is insufficient. It still infects this GD01 strain very poorly. Although at high titer, we could see individual plaques, which in fact are host range mutants. And we could show that by picking these plaques carefully, replating on our M. smegmatis strain and regrowing it, and then retesting. And now you can see this host range mutant HRM1 uh, retains the ability to infect Mycobacterium smegmatis, just like its parent. But now it also uh, uh, efficiently infects and kills this Mycobacterium obsessor strain, whereas the parent does not. So that's how we made number three. So we have one essentially wild type phage, one that's been engineered uh, for being lytic, and a third then that's been engineered and, uh, and, a, and a host range mutant uh, as well. 
So just briefly, I've explained these three phases for, for strain GDO1. I, I, there was this other strain GDO2 from another patient. This was even harder to find phages for. Um, and, and in fact, the patient died in early 2018. And so uh, the, none of the phage work that we could do was, was going to be useful there. Um, these three phages here as part of this cocktail are, are, have this cyphoviral morphology um, and we could grow them to high titer and we could purify them on these cesium chloride equilibrium density gradients um, and we could get them to high titer and, and very clean, uh, relatively simple by growing these in the lab. Obviously, we want to be able to demonstrate that these phages efficiently kill the strain in vitro before putting it into a person. Uh, and and these, these grids here are just showing uh, trays or dishes where we've incubated uh, different amounts of bacteria, uh, as shown here in each of the rows. And then in these, uh, in, these, uh, in these columns, if you like, in these rows here going down, we've incubated with phage, and then we've plated out on, on, the, on solid media and ask what grows. And so the phage, the, the bacteria grow just fine without phage, of course, but then uh, other than um, at high cell concentrations and low phage concentrations, where you see a little bit of survival with these two phages, muddy kills everything uh, uh, very effectively, uh, and all three together in this cocktail, albeit with Muddy doing much of the heavy lifting, very effectively kills these strains. So that's what we chose for our, uh, our therapeutic uh, intervention. So it's a three-phage cocktail uh, together with, with Helen Spencer, who was Isabel's physician, and with Chip Schooley, who had a previous experience with some phage interventions. Um, we, we devised a scheme to give this intravenously twice daily at 10 to the 9 PFU per dose uh, with topical applications to the skin. And obviously this was done under, uh, under the rigorous uh, regulations that were required for compassionate use uh, in, the, in the UK. The outcomes are relatively simple. Uh, she has done very well and continues to do well, um, although um, not necessarily completely bacteria free either. Um, uh, but you can see much improvement of the scans. This is six weeks after the start of treatment. You can see this liver node, which was really badly infected here, is essentially completely gone after six weeks. The, uh, the skin nodules resolved quite well, not quickly, but quite well. Uh, and this incision has, has, has begun to heal uh, quite nicely with the resolution of the infection. There's really no adverse reactions, very well tolerated for a long period of time uh, with good clinical outcomes of the strains that have been isolated since we started infection from, from, from various uh, uh, samples, uh, uh, occasional sputum or bowel samples. Um, all of the strains remain fully susceptible to all the phages that we've, um, that we've given. And so even though the resolution of the infection uh, to the state that it has got was relatively slow. It has not been accompanied by resistance, which we take as a good sign. And I would just mention that we've seen some, uh, some immunological reactivity that you see in Western blots, but nothing that seems to uh, neutralize the, the, the phages uh, with any of, uh, effectiveness. And so this is Isabel here doing, look, looking quite a bit better um, after, after a while of this and her mum uh, and Helen Spencer, her, her, her her doctor. So I want to spend the last few minutes thinking about where you go from here and, and is this a generalizable uh, therapy and what are the challenges in being able to do that? So since this paper was published, we've received a number of requests from, from physicians and, and some patients. And we've been sent to something like about 140 clinical assets, mostly uh, um, obsessors, which in, in part reflects the, the concern and the need out there for, for, ther for additional therapies for these kinds of infections. It clearly is a very serious problem. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about 82 of these strains for which we've done, um, we have a sort of a consolidated uh, analysis with, I think, important uh, messages about, uh, about, about the challenges here. So, so we've, we've characterized these strains genomically and, and phenotypically. We've screened with, a, with our phages and with our expanded phage library. The bottom line is there's great strain variation in phage susceptibility. This is definitely not a one-size-fits-all kind of, kind of uh, utility. Um, colony morphotype is, is critical, as, as I'll show you. These strains, uh, M. obsessus, come in both smooth and rough morphotypes. And which of those 
is present makes a big difference as to whether or not we have a plausible access to, 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 to phages for treatment. I'll say that this concern about fade resistance might have been a little bit overblown in the sense that resistance appears to happen very infrequently. Uh, and we think that it's not unreasonable to use phages as a monotherapy, meaning just one phage alone without a cocktail. Um, uh, and so uh, I'll say a little bit more about that. So just just quickly, genomically, um, this is what a, the, if you look at a conserved site of phylogeny, this is what these strains look like. The blue ones are M. obsessus, the green ones here are Belletti, there's only a couple of them, and these uh, red ones here are the Missiliensi strains. Um, these tend to come in some, for example, this clade here, this prominent clade, other people have described these kinds of profiles. Uh, here's the type strain ATCC19977, subspecies obsessus. Um, however, there is quite a lot of variation once you get outside this major clade here. As I said, they come in rough and smooth. We're surprised to see quite a lot of smooth strains uh, from these patients. It's about 40% or so. You can see these colony morphotypes is quite, is quite uh, evident. Um, the idea is from the literature and other people's uh, studies that this smooth strain is essentially an environmental-like strain, but in patients, uh, you get essentially selection or adaptation with this rough phenotype, which is a much more successful uh, strain from a pathogenicity point of view. And so uh, these uh, events occur that convert from smooth to rough. Uh, and you can map many of these mutations. And there's lots of different types of mutations which interfere with the synthesis of glycopeptidolipids. And these, it's these glycopeptidolipids which are abundant on the smooth strains and, and help to give them that smooth uh, property and, and are absent in these rough strains. So, um, so here's these strains listed again. Here's a lot of data here, and I'm just going to, to point to, to a couple of items uh, here. So here's the, here's the strains. Um, the rough and smooth distribute um, essentially uh, randomly a, a, a across the, the phylogeny. And the phage susceptibility profiles, which is just really illustrated in these first few columns here, is just incredibly varied. It doesn't map closely to the phylogeny at all. And I'm obviously not going to go through the gory details here, but I'll just show you a, 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 an enlargement of part of it. So this is part of that large clade of very closely related strains. There's a mixture of rough and smooth. And many of these shown in black here are not infected by any phages that we can that we can see. Only one of them is infected by phage muddy in this particular series here. BPS uh, infects um, more of these strains. Um, but we see this other than phenotype marked with this X, which are incidents where we have a phage which is lytic and in, can infect, that's shown by the colored circle but they don't kill effectively, and that's shown with the X. And so we have a, a significant problem of strains, especially smooth strains, which are infected but not killed by some of the phages. And then this gives an overall summary of that distribution. Here's the number of rough, here's the number of smooth strains. Let me just point out this number here, which is the number of smooth strains that are killed by one or more phage, and it's zero. So we have no access to phage therapeutic applications for smooth strains at this time. And we're actively trying to understand how we can overcome that problem and how to make some of the phages that can infect but don't kill, how, could, how can we convert those into killers types of phages? They should be virulent, they should kill, but they don't. The good news is that amongst rough strains, 80% are killed by one or more phage. So that's not as high as we would like, but it's not bad. Um, and we can see, however, that um, just 18 of these are infected by only one phage. And this is why this raises the question as to whether could we use one phage by itself um, if we can demonstrate that resistance happens at only a low frequency. I want to comment a little bit on how we can expand the repertoire of the phages that we have. 
I told you that we've exploited the phages that are isolated on smegmatis, and we continue to harvest that, but we've, 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 we, that's obviously been useful to us. We're trying to isolate phages de novo, as I mentioned, from other samples like environmental samples. We continue to do that. But a third approach is illustrated here, which is that, um, and I'm just going to flip back up to here briefly, that by characterizing these genomes, we can show that they are in fact naturally lysogenic. So they carry prophages in their genomes and they do so quite prolifically. And all of these boxes are just illustrating different types of prophages present in these strains. Now, if prophages are resident in these strains, then they're likely, we expect them to be spontaneously released from those strains. And if that's true, the trick then is to try to find a combination of uh, pairs of strains for which one will spontaneously release a phage into its supernatant and a second strain which will act as a recipient. So we can do large numbers of these sort of pair, what, pairwise tests where we have a lawn of one strain, this is GD29, and then we've spotted on the supernatants, culture supernatants of these other strains, and we look for signs of infection. And here on this plate, you can see both here and here, two strains which appear to be releasing a phage that can infect this strain. So this is still work in progress, but you can see nine new phages that we've isolated here. These do not infect Mycobacterium smegmatis. They're genomically different from all of the other types that I've just shown you, so new types of phages. And then as we look on these other various M obsessive strains, this is just showing just four examples, you can see some infect some strains. There's a lot of specificity, but we think that this is a, a good reservoir of new phages that we can recover that could potentially be used therapeutically once they've been appropriately engineered. And this just illustrates one of these phages. This came from strain GD89, so we call it Phi GD89-1. And here in this killing assay, we can see that this phage quite efficiently kills the strain GD14, for which we had no other phages that infected and killed that strain. So this is expanding our repertoire so that we can get not to 80%, but currently up to about 85% of strains uh, of the rough strains, uh, if we can include these. So lastly was this point about resistance. I want to mention just, just to say that we've looked at many combinations of phages with strains, and this is the most common finding. This is about 10 to the seven, between 10 to the seven and 10 to the eight bacteria challenged with a single phage here, plated out for survival. And essentially you get commonly no survivors at all. There are some, a few set of uh, uh, circumstances or combinations where you get some survivors, but they're normally not stably resistant when you pick them and you retest them. So they have survived, they may be transiently resistant, but then definitely not stably resistant. There are in some instances, a few strains where we have got resistant mutants. So resistance is rare, uh, it's infrequent and it's rare. And even though I, I told you that smooth strains are not well infected by phages. So you could imagine reversion from rough to smooth would give you resistance phenotype. And in fact, there's only one strain that we've actually seen that happen. Reversion to smooth happens almost not at all in these strains. And I've just illustrated that resistance uh, can be, uh, we either don't see resistance at all when we check the colonies, as I mentioned. Some of them can be fully resistant, but you get these partially resistant phenotypes as well. So there's a whole spectrum, but we think that phage resistance is not nearly the, the problem that we thought it would be. We still think it's good to use phages in combination, um, but, uh, but, but if you only have one phage and the patient is in need, I think there's a rationale for using it. We've been involved in a dozen or more additional uh, interventions. I'm not going to go through these in detail. Most of them are ongoing. Um, uh, but I think we've seen at least encouraging signs of you know, conversion to culture negative or, or smear negative samples, reduction of bacterial load. Uh, and there's obviously much to be learned uh, about those profiles. But, um, but, uh, but, but we are learning. Uh, and I think that we have, we have recourse for other, other therapies. 
So let me just sum up by say, I've, I, I think I've uh, illustrated clearly there's a, as a need to do something about these M. abscessus infections out there for which there's very few options for treating these strains. Um, that we've made, a, I think, a good use of M. smegmatis phages, um, plus been able to expand that by using spontaneous induction of naturally occurring prophages, uh, which, although they need to be further engineered to be used therapeutically, we think we have the tools for doing that. And in general, uh, this combination of phage isolation coupled with phage genome engineering uh, and use of host range manipulation, host range expansion is a, is a set of tools that still can be uh, 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 exploited um, to, to further extend the number of strains that we can infect. Um, clearly, the, 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 this massive variation in phage susceptibilities is, is an issue that prevents us from putting just an, uh, a pharmaceutical on the shelf for treatment. Uh, Pre-screening for strains is still, uh, I, I think, absolutely required. And from what we know about the genomics, there is no way of predicting uh, from the genomic information as to which phages are likely to infect. And as I mentioned, we have pretty good success with rough strains and, and, and the smooth strains are a problem that we need to, uh, we need to address. Uh, and, and although all of the other interventions we've been, been involved in have been on a compassionate use basis, although uh, both in the US and, and globally, um, we'd love to get into more uh, expanded access and proper, proper trials to try to understand um, more about uh, not only not only safety but efficacy, routes of administration, dosage, all of which remain as ill-defined for this as they do for most phage therapy uh, 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 trials. I'll just very briefly uh, thank the many many people involved in, in in this work. I've highlighted those in in, in yellow here who have been key players in the. Uh, therapeutic um, work that I've mentioned, uh, and I'm just going to give a good big shout out to all of those thousands of students and their, their faculty instructors who have uh, generated these incredible collections of phages. And this is just a picture uh, from the one of the prior C phages annual symposium held at uh, the Geneva Research Campus, uh, hosted by HHMI. Uh, and I'll stop there and say thank you for your attention, and I'll be delighted to answer all and any questions. Graham, well, thank you for that truly spectacular work, spectacular progress through discovery biology to translational biology to engineering to now therapeutic potential. Um, maybe I'll begin with the first question. So you've shown extraordinarily well proof of concept that individual phages can be engineered to have therapeutic relevance, and that's spectacular. As you mentioned, we're a long way from having an antibiotic that is phage based sitting on the shelf. And one potential approach, if we learn from you know, cellular gene therapists, might be to take uh, molecular determinants of lytic behavior, put them in a common backbone, and then you will have an antibiotic that will have some kind of host range may be effective against, you know, who knows what, but it'll be effective against something. And that is then scalable and adaptable and studyable, et cetera. Um, can you comment on that approach? Is that really feasible? Is that the direction that you're going? Or is the future more this one-off screening and engineer out repressors and, and hope to get activity? Yeah, I think that, that um... That, so it's a great question, and I would just just would recognize the the vast void between where we are and where we would like to be. Um, this is uh, it feels like we're still talking about 19th century uh, medicine when we talk about using phages in this way. Um, it, it's kind of ridiculous, right? Uh, it seems like where we want to be is with a completely synthetic, design based approach where you can build pharmaceuticals by design in a defined way they have the properties that they kill efficiently the way the phages do they maybe have the replicative ability but you put in there the genes you need 
you take out the genes that you don't need or don't know what they do. You add your bells and whistles, which add well-defined and predictable properties of host range killing ability, etc., et to to counteract defense mechanisms. You, you could, all of that can be done can be done through a completely synthetic approach. Um, you know, DNA synthesis and genome engineering methods are are, are, are getting very sophisticated. Um, and so that's where we should be, uh, and and we should be doing you know twenty first century science and medicine with these. We're stuck where we are in part because we really don't understand um, what most of the parameters are. We don't understand what the determinants of specificity are from the phage point of view or from the host point of view. And so um, you'd love to be able to do it by design and do it synthetically. But it's hard to know what to design or how you design it right now, right now, because we really don't understand those basics. And so um, that doesn't mean that, in my mind, that that we shouldn't try to learn about. We should try to do the basic biology to understand, you know, the microbiology of how these systems work. But it seems like we can also take these potentially therapeutic agents and get them into patients where it is appropriate and where there is need and to learn from that and then to move forward with defined clinical trials to learn about the parameters and the efficacy. And all of that is gonna move the ball forward. Um, but but I, totally, I totally agree that that's not, that's getting us to where we want to get to relatively slowly. And the, the, the goal would be to completely in design uh, and synthetic approach. And, and would you say that's true, Graham, of uh, can you extrapolate to other organisms or do you think this is something that is more specific to mycobacteria and their, and their unique characteristics? I think it's, it's, it's generally true. Um, the, um, at, its, at its root is, so at its root is the problem of dealing with, with uh, specificity. Right, it's understanding and manipulating specificity, and that issue is going to be more important for some pathogens than others. Um, we could sort of go through those, but it's true for many pathogens, and and therefore you want to be able to understand those determinants, and then you want to be able to build things by design that overcome that for whatever the particular pathogen there is. It, I don't. There may be cl big, huge clinical differences in how you administer or use a particular phage or a phage-like entity for treatment, um, depending on the disease. Um, but it shouldn't be that dependent on the pathogen, right? You should be able to manipulate the phages so that they'll uh, work in a predictable uh, way on whatever the pathogen of choice is. And it may be that you have a single platform that you add the bells and whistles that are necessary for a particular pathogen or strains within a particular pathogen. It's just that at the moment, um, we can't do that in any uh, uh, facile way. Well, the other way might be to take putative host range determinants, create the vector, and screen across a platform of, of all the organisms. And that, that gives you the building blocks to understand host range determinants and, of course, binding kinetics. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, some of this work has been done in the, the development of the Taylorsins or whatever you'd like to call them, which are a sort of obviously a related sort of issue. I just, I, I, I would just sort of say that it's, it's a, I think it's a, it's a pretty complex problem, right? Which is partly why we haven't solved it or understand it, right? Because the determinants of specificity are not only what happens at the surface with recognition of the receptor, although clearly that's very important. A lot of it is what happens after the DNA is inside the cell. After all, that's what restriction. Uh, modification and CRISPR-Cas, that all happens, got nothing to do with receptors. That's after the DNA gets into the cell. And I think that there's every indication that the number and types and the variety of these defense systems is probably huge. It's not two or three or four or five or six more. It's, it's tens or hundreds or thousands or maybe tens of thousands. And if you look at all the stuff, all the defense mechanisms putatively encoded by the phages themselves, like as in temperate phages, there could be thousands of those alone. And so we, we just don't understand that complexity. And so if we did understand that, then we could do this, we could do a, a much more well-designed um, a, a strategy. And, and I think that investigating the determinants of specificity ultimately is going to 
be what's going to sort of break open that path so we can we can design uh, specificity by choice. Yeah. And um, I think we have time for one question. Uh, how, this is has to do with how much time it took to engineer the lysogenic phage to knock out the repressor gene. And, and on what did, did it actually occur? It, did it occur on the prophagic form? So the, the, the engineering, so we've, we, um, the engineering is done on lytically growing phages. Um, and just very briefly, it's done using a recombinering system that we designed. So essentially we make strains that are expressing some phage recombinases, which greatly increase the recombination frequency so that when you put in a phage DNA and a DNA substrate of choice, you get recombination between them and you can therefore design these particular uh, uh, changes. Um, we've further enhanced that technology by adding in uh, uh, an, an optional second CRISPR mediated counter selection method, which increases the, um, uh, the frequency that you can recover recombinants. Uh, the, the first, the recombinating method we, we call bred bacteriophage recombining, uh, recombinating on electroprid DNA. The modified method is called crispy bread because it's a combination or toast, as my postdoc likes to call it, because it's a combination of using CRISPR selection and, and, and bread engineering. But it's done on lytic phages uh, and it can be done in order to make, to do precise, to make precise deletions which, do, which are not recombinant. And so this is important if you're thinking about uh, the regulations that govern GMO and recombinant organisms. Um, and it's the, it's the efficiency with which you can do this, which, which enables you to make recombinants without selection. Well, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. That was absolutely fascinating. And we really appreciate you taking the time to teach us about uh, phages, mycobacterial phages. Um, if we're going to have to whisk a gram away to the next meeting, but um, we have the questions that were submitted and we'll try to collate them and try to get back to folks. Um, thank you all for uh, attending. Next week, we will have Dr. Julia Willette uh, from the University of Minnesota. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.